today's guest is Dan Leonello. He's a serial entrepreneur and a master facilitator at Painted Picture. Dan, thanks for coming on the show. Tats, you're very welcome. I'm excited to be here. Um, it's been a long time coming. Yeah, so yeah, I've known you for, for a while. But one of the things I, I've never asked you in any detail is you have a campground within the family. Yes. Tell us about yep. that. Oh, my goodness. Um, just the, uh, the camp is uh, in Penticton on Skaha Lake. It's, a, it's an RV resort. Um, this is actually our 50th anniversary. Um, wow. Yeah, my brother and I, my brothers and I have, have, you know, we grew up working there. Um, our parents bought it 50 years ago, and then we bought it from them about 20 years ago. So <clears throat> um, it's, it's beautiful. It's right on the beach. Uh, we've, we've got almost a kilometer of waterfront on Skaha Lake. Um, and we've, we've sort of tripled the size of the camp now. It's got 250 uh, sites. Uh, it's more like a resort. Uh, we've got all kinds of activities for families, uh, dinners and entertainment. Um, we uh, have 25 trailers as well that we rent out with the sites. So people can literally jump in their car and then stop, unpack, and they're on the beach camping with their families. That's awesome. Well, growing up there, you must have had a lot of good memories. What's your um, What's your favorite memory at at uh, campground? Wow, um, I would say the the favorite memory is the just the camaraderie of the people. I mean, we've got people coming from, you know, in in normal cases all over, you know, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, Washington, Oregon would be the the the, the the most, the highest, the majority of people that came, um, but then also people from all over the world. Um, I remember, God, I remember 74, these two Greyhound buses showed up from Texas that were converted. We'd never seen anything like that before. <laughs> you walk inside and there's a couch and a fridge and a TV and, and it, was, it was incredible. And that's, uh, you know, based, you know, after seeing all the 13 foot trailers that came in all the time at that point, the technology, the size has just incredibly changed over the years. Um, you know, they, they don't call it glamping for no reason. Um, you know, <laughs> we, we've now got, you know, power, water, sewer, um, wireless internet, uh, all, all of the comforts of home so that when you're camping, you can still either work if you choose to, um, but, uh, you know, or you jump in the lake, go down the river channel, Go golfing hiking it's 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 spectacular wonderful wonderful yeah, yeah i think you know things do change and evolve yeah. and i know that with your other business which is you know linked to supply chain new product development things change all the time tell me about that side because that's how we met originally right i will but before i forget um i didn't know we were going to be talking about the camp for everyone that's listening it's rightspeechcamp.com I hope you're okay. I said that, Tat. Yeah, um, yeah. Hey. you wouldn't be, would be an entrepreneur if you didn't mention it, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's right with a W, like the guys that flew the airplanes. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, the, the technology and manufacturing company is really interesting because I, I started it 30 years ago uh, as the manufacturing company when, when the majority of products were, were still built in North America. Um, over the years, as we know, uh, manufacturing shifted. Uh, about 15 years ago, we, we moved a lot of our production to an outsourced model. Um, and, you know, the, the majority of it would be in Asia and, and some of it is still local. Uh, and, and it was really interesting that after we made that shift, one of the things that I discovered is that we had become an information company. And by that, I mean the quality and timeliness of the information between our customers, ourselves, ourselves, the vendors. Um, really determined whether or not I could sleep at night. And, uh, and, and so we built a lot of systems to manage the, what is really transfer and, and, and uh, shifting of information uh, for all of the different custom orders that we were building. And, uh, and then I would say three, four years after that, I realized that um, if someone were to build a platform that managed all of this stuff, uh, it could significantly change 
uh, the world of, of manufacturing, especially outsourced manufacturing. Yeah, for sure. Now, one of the reasons, uh, you know, we came to you at the time because we were doing a lot of product launches and new product development stuff is uh, you were looking, uh, we were looking to find an ODM. And I know a lot more people know about OEM, but can you sort of explain the differences? And is there any difference in sourcing a OEM versus an ODM? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, an ODM is when the factory does the design for you um, and, uh, and build the tooling and, and all of those things. If you're an OEM and it's, and, and most people think of OEMs as Ford, Boeing, uh, GM. Um, but in reality, if you are a company that designs your own product and then has it built or builds it, you are by definition an OEM because you're building an original equipment. Um, and, but most people are using the word brand. So for, for small and medium sized OEMs. Uh, and I haven't been able to find another word that I can use. I say OEM, people get confused. I say brand, they don't. So if you design your own product and then have it manufactured and then sell it into the market and distribution, then you are by definition an OEM. An ODM uh, is an original design manufacturer. And what they'll do is they'll actually do the design for you. Um, and, and then one of the, the and what I would say is if you're working with an ODM, unless you get very good documentation from them, um, while and after they're building your product, you actually have a very um, weak business model because at any moment they could shift, they could stop sending to, selling to you, uh, they could potentially be selling out the back door. Uh, there are all kinds of different reasons that an ODM actually is a very weak business model. Um, and, and so if you are, or anyone who is working with an ODM, I would highly recommend that they insist on getting all of the design drawings and that's everything from the, so if you, if you remember your, the, the product we did for you, Tat, it was, there were probably 400 different drawings to manage that thing. So rather than going to an ODM, what we did was we went to an industrial designer and we had them reverse engineer the product that you wanted and then essentially build what's called a bomb or a bill of materials that describes the whole assembly when it's all put together. And then it explodes each component of that assembly uh, all the way down to the root parts so that you can see the, all of the individual little parts that have to get ordered. And then you can see how each one of those parts goes together with other parts to create components and assemblies. And then how the whole thing is brought together in a finished product, which has to include the packaging the printing, um, all of those things, which may change from, from time to time or, or country to country for that matter. Um, and so without all of that documentation in your possession, if something goes wrong with that factory, you are at high, high risk of potentially at any point having your supply just shut off. And if, you, if it shuts off and you don't have that design information, then you now have to go through the process of reverse engineering again or getting another ODM to do it and then being at risk once again. Mm, yeah. So, so if, you're, if you're interested in controlling your own destiny and mitigating risk so that as you build this company, it continues to stay strong, then you will insist that either you do the design or work with an industrial designer uh, so that you own those drawings or that, that part of your agreement with an ODM is that they supply you with all of that information including the sub vendors that they're using for all of the component parts. Um, because if they go down and you try to rebuild that whole supply chain, it's going to take you as long as it did the very first time, mm -hmm. which is another six, nine, 12 months. Yeah, for sure. Now, uh, you know, I know some of the things that were happening back then, but I, I'll ask the question now, do you st still need to have people on the ground in, if, if, in a sort of foreign country, if it is sort of uh, outsourced to a foreign country, or has the communication and technology gone good enough that um, you can do it remotely? So with respect to um, quality control, it's, it's really interesting, Tat. 
people think quality control is sending a team into a factory to inspect and reject or approve things at the final stage. Um, one of the things I think you've probably heard of lean manufacturing, the theory of lean is you don't add value to anything that doesn't conform. So true quality control starts literally when you're making your drawings. I, I actually say quality control starts with the first keystroke because the engineers, as they design them uh, and, and they, you know, they deal with stacking tolerances um, and, and, uh, and all of the different pieces that they need to build that all have to come together to make a final product. That's where quality control starts. And that's why I talked so much about making sure that you own the designs and own the toolings, et cetera, um, and the supply chain. Um, so, and then when it comes to the factories, quality control starts with your qualification process of the factory. So if, you're, if your filter is, I want the cheapest price and I don't care, then the odds are you're paying a cheap price for someone that, or for a company that may not have good systems in place and may not um, perform well for you, in which case that cheapest price is now um, turned into a premium price because you have to hire a team to go in and inspect and reject. And because they're, if, they're, if the company that's building it is having a lot of problem with rejections, they will then start cranking your price up to pay for all the stuff that's getting thrown in the garbage. Yeah. So step one from the factory standpoint, absolutely is the qualification process. We've got a 12 step process that, that you know, the first stage filters out probably 80, 85% of the potential factories because we just ask them to fill out a simple form and most of them don't. Um, and then when you get to the point where you've got, you know, a half a dozen that are going to work with you, then you go through the next stages of the qualification. Now the qualification process includes someone taking a look at it. Absolutely. But it's a lot less costly for someone to visit a, a factory once or once a year than it is to have them be on the floor every time anything is being built and shipped. Yeah. And so what we look for are, are companies that um, show that they have a high degree of attention to detail, i.e. working through our process of qualification and the things that the information they put there. Um, we look for, you know, for companies that understand integrity. In other words, they do what they say they're going to do. And if they don't, they find a way to fix it. Um, you know, they understand customer service, et cetera. And, you know, some of those things you can get up front and some of those things uh, you get from working with the companies over time. Uh, but, you know, the, the higher, the higher, excuse me, the further they go along, in other words, if they go through our qualification process, the probability is high that, that we've worked with them enough and understand them enough from an integrity and service standpoint that we can start to work with them going forward. So, so, so for me, you know, the way I look at it is um, we really want to have quality information that the factory is working from. And I can tell you this. My experience, 50% of the time that something's built incorrectly, it's not the factory's fault. It's the information they got from someone else. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we can, we can relate that back to the platform that we're building, you know, in, in time. Uh, and so, you know, we were able to build a system whereby when we had these factories qualified, we literally don't inspect the product and it ships factory direct to our customers without us see ever seeing it. And we've been able to put a system in place that allows that to happen on an ongoing basis. And when things do go wrong, then we've got a way to fix it. But it, it really does minimize the probability that something's going to go wrong. Yeah, for sure. So I, I like to talk about sort of more uh, timeless concepts, but I know, you know, with, with COVID, uh, a lot of companies' supply chain and supply chain weaknesses were exposed. What sort of adjustments have you seen companies making in that area? Well, it's really interesting. Um, it goes again to A, the, the quality of the factories that you're working with and the, and the teams in those factories. Um, but one of the biggest things that COVID exposed was the lack of resilience in supply chain. Um, and and you know, part of it is uh, geographic, which when, when the planes were down, you weren't gonna be able to get product. When, when the factories in China were down because they were dealing with COVID, 
um, you know, nothing was being built, so nothing was going to be shipped. So, you know, resilience is a really, and, and risk mitigation are things that are on the forefront of people that are in production, but they don't always make it to the forefront of leadership. So leadership looks at these preventative costs as something that they would rather, and it was interesting, I was listening to a podcast or a, a video yesterday on, it's called Upstream, which is um, fixing things upstream instead of having emergencies all the time. And so upstream fixes, uh, some leadership teams will look at them as unnecessary costs because they don't realize that the cost of the emergencies is often 10 or even 100 times more expensive in the long run than doing this fix one time only. And the reason is you're doing it over and over again. Um, and so, you know, what it exposed is geographically, we probably want to have um, secondary facilities, you know, as a backup, but not necessarily in the same geographic region um, for the first part. The second is that the information that factories have is typically outdated, but we have made changes with them or, or they've made changes internally that we don't even know about. And so if there have been either changes or improvements made in production that we don't know, then when we take our drawings and send them to another factory, the drawings are actually old and out of date and they're gonna give you something that isn't gonna be what you want. So document control, single source of truth, the ability to, to own your information and be able to move it, including downstream supply chain, excuse me, upstream supply chain um, from, from your vendors is paramount to both security, um, risk mitigation, and resilience in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you talk about what you're working on at the very end, but I, I, gotta, yeah. I, gotta t I know you can go on supply chain uh, a while, but I'm going to tangent a bit to your entrepreneurial side again, because I know yeah. you've worked with world-class entrepreneurs like, uh, I think, Brian uh, yeah. of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Mm -hmm. And you have this process called Painted Picture. Why don't you walk yes. us through that? Sure. Um, I, I've literally worked with like hundreds of entrepreneurs and their leadership teams through this process. And, uh, you know, there's a history that, that lesson that I can give you at another time about where the whole thing came from. But the process itself is, is you know, first of all, defining the future that, that you want in your life as a, as a business owner. Um, but then secondarily defining the business itself, like painting a picture of what it looks like five years from now, so that it aligns with where you want to go in life. And, and when you're painting that picture, you're literally asking yourself, you know, what the revenues are, um, what the financial model looks like, so you know what the profits are, because the, the, the really interesting thing is, if you know what your lifestyle wants to be in five years, then you want to reverse engineer this painted picture of your company so that it will support what it is that you're wanting to create. And a lot of times there's a misalignment there. Um, and the, the beauty of, of painting a picture of what your company looks and feels like, um, you may or may not get the markets correct, but the beautiful thing is if you know where it is you're going and what it looks like, then the house will start to show up. Um, and the reason is you can then use this picture, painted picture as a, as a decision filter when you have choices to make going along in the business. And if, if you're looking at a choice and you ask yourself, you know, will this choice get me that result? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, then you're going in the right direction. If the answer is no, which a lot of entrepreneurs like to chase shiny baubles, um, you know, it might be actually taking you away from what you're trying to create. And so the beauty of, uh, of, of the process is you can see where it is you want to go. You can reverse engineer it all the way down to things that you need to execute on tomorrow. That, and, and one of the biggest pieces is the process drives you to do and to learn. Um, my CEO calls it PDSA, plan, do, study, adjust. And if you actually plan, do, study, and adjust daily, then you'll be making incremental, um, uh, basically adjustments in your direction that will keep you on track to get to that painted picture. A, a great example is if you're a fraction of a degree off when, you're, when you leave the earth to go to the moon, 
you're going to be hundreds of thousands of miles away from it by the time you get there <laughs> if you don't make any adjustments. So, you know, the, the, the sailors of, of, of yore um, used to have something they called waypoints. And the reason they call them waypoints is it's, it's a point on the way to where they're going. And if they don't see that waypoint, then they have to adjust so they do in order to know that they're actually going to get where they're going. So this is, it's an ancient process. People have been doing it as long as there's been people. Um, the biggest thing is that today, most of us get stuck in the how. As soon as we think about something we'd like to create, the next thought is, how am I going to do that? And all of the uncertainty of the, of the path and the journey tends to create a big cloud that then stops people from even taking their first step. So the best thing you can do is determine where it is you want to go, what it looks like, and then reverse engineer it in chunks. Like if you've got a five year, then what does the company have to look like in one year in order to make this five year? You break it down into quarters. What does each quarter need to look like? And then this quarter you break into months and then you break into weeks this month and you break this week into days. So that literally every day you're asking yourself, what worked, what didn't work, what did I learn? And based on these results, what am I gonna to do tomorrow in order to get there? And what it does is you're actually making little micro adjustments on a daily basis. You're checking out what those results were on a weekly and a monthly basis. And over time, and, and one of the things TATS that's paramount is for this journey, we typically don't know any or very little of what we we're going to need to know in the future. So one of the questions that I ask and I ask my teams and, and I ask any team I'm working with is based on what you expect to be doing next quarter, what is it that you think you're going to need to learn for that? And the question is, do you want to learn it as you're doing it? Or do you want to start learning it now so that you can learn? So literally, one of the things you're doing on a regular basis is learning what you need to learn because you're starting to be able to see how you need to be able to perform in the next week, the next month, the next year. So a big chunk of my time is learning. I'm on that journey right now with this new technology company. I, you know, I started it four years ago. I, I, I knew that there was a massive learning curve in front of me. Um, I, and frankly, I also knew that it was a very, very big, personal growth project for me because for for this project to turn into what I had in a, as a vision I was going to have to learn and grow and change things that had been stopping me from performing in the past in certain areas or just learn stuff that I'd never actually had the time to or needed to learn in, in the past so it's, it's incredible. Now, one of the things that I do, and this is my own, um, I guess you guys would call it a hack, but my own hack is I don't do well reading books because it doesn't anchor for me. So what I do is I, and this is why I was looking it upstream yesterday. Um, I actually will find a video, typically about an hour long, um, that is, is being presented by the author of the book. And I will watch that one or maybe a couple of videos to hear what they have to say, hear all of the uh, message and lesson and learning, but I can do it, you know, in an hour, maybe two around that specific book. Um, if there's a subject that I need to learn about, you know, I'm, I'm navigating through YouTube and I'm finding the best of the best and I'm learning from them. Uh, and, and what's really interesting is People that have experienced things in the past, when they're talking about that experience on, on the videos, um, they're essentially giving you what was their playbook. They're telling you what worked for them, what didn't work for them, the things that got in their way. Um, oftentimes, they're describing me or my company as, uh, as it is today, as theirs was before they had gone through this journey. Um, and so being able to, to see that, hear it, um, even just watch, you know, their faces, their voices, their, their inflections, their body language as they describe going through the journey is incredible. And, and for me, that anchors it very well 
So the biggest thing I would say is on your learning journey, really identify what the method is that best anchors the learning for you and spend your time in that space on the things that you want to learn. Wonderful. So you touched on it a bit. You're on this big journey to change the supply chain industry, if, if I'm framing that correctly. Um, yep. Explain to me what you're doing and how you're approaching it. Wow. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the One of the things that a number of advisors have said is if you if you pick a project that is very ambitious and very big um it will grow you the most um it will also um attract people that understand that we are not scared to at least state this big vision so this this um you know, the, 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 the purpose of this project is to create trust and transparency in the global supply web. Uh, and, and so what we've done is we've taken, first of all, all of the processes and systems that we put in place so that I could sleep at night with the sourcing company. And we, we literally, in the beginning, built a platform and a, a core engine that manages all of the communications, all the information, and as a result, all of the quality between us and our customers and us and all of our vendors. We, we turned that piece of technology on to run our company two years ago, a little more than two years ago. And it has been acting as our customer service, vendor management, quality management, that actually acts as our bookkeeper as well, because it, it's a single source of truth and as a result, it can actually post all of our transactions, both on the buy and sell side, the top half of the P&L and QuickBooks all by itself. Um, and when you look at all of those things, you know, the information that, that passes through hands in the outsource manufacturing world, um, it, gets, it gets actually input three or four times on both sides of the transaction. And then if there's a quality issue, it gets input three or four more times. Plus all that information is managed with really smart people, spreadsheets, Word documents, email, Slack, WhatsApp, WeChat, text, phone calls, all of these different methods. They're disparate and everybody's using something different. Um, so the amount of both uh, pure labor for managing the information uh, and then the labor for managing mistakes, again, we're talking upstream, right, um, is immense. So the, the, when we, we turned on the technology and once it was up and running, it's actually, it's reduced our labor by 75% in terms of the amount of, of information that needs to be managed with people because so much of it, the, the, the process, the state changes, everything is managed inside the platform. So we don't need people to be shuffling that information. Um, that created for us the resources to then take this core engine and turn it into a platform that can be used by literally anyone on the planet um, to manage their outsourced manufacturing relationships. So the product acts, uh, you know, you can use it as both a vendor and a, and a, uh, and a supplier. So it's the state, if you look at the, uh, go back a step, most manufacturing with outsourcing has between three and eight different tiers of manufacturers in a chain, in, in any individual product chain um, below the tier zero, which is the, the OEM. And so if you're an OEM and you're working with a company that's a contract manufacturer, you see what they show you, but you see nothing else. With our platform, you'll be able to literally um, build out all of the sub vendors, share them with the vendors up above and get sight into, you know, deep into the supply web, we're calling it, as opposed to supply chain, because there are so many different relationships that happen that all have to be managed. So what the product does uh, is it, it uh, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, it's the company name is Omne, O-M-N-A-E Technologies. So what Omni does is it actually um, manages the communications, the information, the quality, so the whole relationship, 
between the different outsource manufacturers. Um, and then at a, at a macro scale, um, we actually look at each company as sort of a node in the web because of all of these intricate relationships that are happening. And, um, and we believe that we can build out uh, basically what will be a supply chain social network that manages the utility between individual companies. But as a result, it will have performance information for everyone that's on the system so that we can then aggregate how each company is performing and present their actual performance data at a high level. Um, so that when you're, you know, we talked earlier about qualifying a new factory. In this case, you would actually see how they perform for everyone else that they're dealing with in the system. So if their on time rate is 95% for everyone else, then it's reasonable to think that they'll do the same thing for you. If their on time rate is 75% for everyone else, it's reasonable to think that they'll do the same thing for you. So the data um, and the analytics about sort of the, uh, the manufacturers of the world and, the, and their performance ability um, will become more transparent. And I believe it's gonna make everyone get better. Because if you're not performing and it's visible, you're going to have two choices: get better or get gone. <laughs> That's awesome. Your 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 passion for for these projects and your uh, love of entrepreneurship always. I always enjoy talking to you, Dan. Um, yeah, I, I think um, people got a lot out of it. And um, yeah, definitely go check out his his website. But uh, Dan, always yes. good to talk to you, and appreciate it. Thank you very much, Tats. I appreciate it as well. Um, look forward to seeing you again soon.